I think it started. Okay. Yeah, it started. So, um, Chi Pong Liu is a Simons Quantum Postdoctoral Fellow at Simons Institute for the Theory of, Com of Computing, hosted by Shafi Goldwasser and Umesh Vazirani. He earned his PhD degree at Princeton University in 2021 under the supervision of Professor Mark Zendry. He primarily focused on quantum computing and cryptography, including understanding the post-quantum security of existing crypto systems and building cryptography with the power of quantum information. Let, let us all welcome our speaker. Thanks. Um, the recording has started and everything has been fixed, right? So I can start. All right. Yeah, yeah, please. OK, OK, thanks. All right, so the, the talk is uh, mostly based on my recent work, but also a line of my uh, previous works. The title is called Non-Uniformity Quantum Advice and Quantum Random Oracles, and I will explain uh, all these uh, notions on the title one by one. So, uh, so before I start, I want to convey the main message, which is the following. So we all know Grover's search, right? Which is the quantum brute force algorithm. Um, so in this uh, talk, I will basically going to show that quant this quantum brute force algorithm, the Grover search, cannot be speed up, even if you have uh, access to a piece of quantum advice as long as the advice is not too large. OK, so that's the main message. So because you can you can think about like what if uh, there's like a pre-processing algorithm which gets some arbitrary knowledge about this function, which uh, later the algorithm will do some function inversion on the uh, on this uh, target function. And maybe the advice contains some very useful information for the algorithm to do it function inversion later. And this uh, talk is going to show that it's actually uh, not possible. Even this advice is quantum. Okay, so let's start with some uh, very preliminary knowledge about uh, cryptography. So here in this talk, I will focus on the cryptographic hash. So, um, so the hash function, the uh, which uh, is very important, and in the talk we will study the security of hash functions. Uh, you know, which has applications to daily internet usage, blockchains, and man many, many other uh, cases. A hash function is basically a function h, which takes an arbitrary input, uh, sorry, an arbitrary length input, and outputs the short digest uh, of a fixed length. Let's say the, the output is of length m bits. And a hash function should be publicly known. So what does that mean? That means everybody can get the code of the uh, of the hash function and it can evaluate the hash function on its own device. So the code is public and everybody can uh, pick uh, their favorite input and observe the uh, corresponding output. And a good, a good hash function should satisfy a bunch of properties for different crypto applications. So here, uh, let, me, let me give you some example. For example, collision resistance. Uh, many it's hard for uh, algorithm to find two distinct input that maps to the same output. Or one witness, which means it's hard to find the pre-image of, uh, of some image. And also other ideal properties, for example, you want hash function to be used for you know, building uh, signatures or building non-interactive zero-knowledge proof. Then you need to have the hash function to satisfy something uh, like in fetch mirror or in some other uh, scenario. But here in this talk, I will focus on the most basic, most fundamental things, which are uh, collision resistance and one witness. All right. Um, OK, so here's the one example of a practical hash function we use, uh, which is the uh, uh, SHAR2, or the full name is secure hash function, the second generation. It's based on this crypto uh, construction called the Merkle Dam Guard. You don't need to um, really understand what's going on if you're not familiar with the, the crypto behind that. But um, the important thing, the important message I want to mention is that this practical hash function is very efficient and is really useful in many applications, including, you know, uh, having, you know, signatures or, be, you know, building encryption schemes. Okay, so it's very efficient. Uh, it's also seems to be secure, but actually the security, the, there was one uh, problem with this almost all practical hash functions is that their security is very hard to argue because if you just look at this picture on, on the slide, you know, it, this hash function contains so many blocks 
and you know also this like the underlying Merkle Dam gotta makes it very very difficult to analyze even for you know understanding this one way function the security of it being a one way function in other words trying to find a pre image under this practical hash function is almost impossible to analyze. So that's the problem with practical hash functions. So although hash functions are very useful, we have lots of troubles with that. And therefore, facing with this difficulty, Belair and Rogaway, they uh, propose one uh, solution to this problem, which is called this random oracle methodology. So the, it's a very, very clean and beautiful model, and it says the following. For most of the natural application of hash function, as what I mentioned before, uh, for example, encryption, uh, signatures. If we implement this hash function in a, in a very, in, in the best way, then the security in practice, which is uh, in this like yellow box on the left side of the yellow box, is, a, is this is an algorithm having access to the hash function. The security in practice is roughly the same as its security in this so-called random oracle model. So let me uh, explain what is this model. So in this model, instead of having this practical hash function, like this Merkle dam got this char2 I just mentioned, we are now model this hash function as a uniform random function, which is drawn at the very beginning. So it's not a, not a function with random output. Uh, like in other words, it's not like a function. Every time you give a fixed input, it gives you different things. It's a function which, it's like a fixed function with fixed outputs, but it's uniformly drawn from all possible functions. Right. So the security is almost the same as an algorithm having Oracle access to this uh, random function, which is drawn at the very beginning. Right. So this is the random Oracle methodology saying that for most natural applications, you can always try to estimate security of your uh, of your uh, construction by replacing this hash function with a random Oracle with a random function. And if the running time of A is T, then we can put the running time of B to be T as well. And you can think about this T as basically the number of query this algorithm make to the uh, function F. All right. So this is the random Oracle methodology and it captures almost all generic attacks. And by generic attacks, I mean uh, a kind of uh, uh, one type of attack which only explore the input and output behavior of uh, uh, of the function of the hash function, but not really looking at the code or not, not really uh, using any side information about this edge. All right. So uh, having this random Oracle methodology, it's um, solve a lot of problem. Uh, for example, it provides simple proofs for many uh, analyzed and also very good, uh, very precise bond and also the bond will usually match with uh, the algorithm. So let, let's look at some example. So one way function, which is uh, the task of inverting an image. In this case, in the random Oracle model, we can prove that the algorithm can achieve at most T over N advantage. So here by advantage, I mean by making T queries, what's the maximum probability an algorithm can achieve uh, of uh, finding a pre image. And this actually uh, match with the uh, with the algorithm because the best algorithm you can come out with is basically brute force attack, right? You 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 draw a bunch of random input and you're trying to see if the output matches with the image you want to find the pre-image. So that's uh, tight and also the analyze will be very simple. And similarly for PRG, it's similar. It's uh, oh sorry, I didn't I didn't mention I didn't mention what does that mean by PRG. But uh, the goal is basically trying to distinguish if the outcome of this hash function is uh, looks like a sample uniformly at a random. So it's, if that looks like a random string. And also for collision resistant hash function, the CRHF, um, we can also show that the bound is basically bursted paradox. In other words, um, if you have T queries, the best you can do is uh, having success probability T square over N. And that also matches with the uh, success, oh, sorry, also match, matches with the algorithm. Well, the algorithm is simply trying to, you know, uh, query a bunch of random input output pairs and trying to see if there's any collision. Okay, so this is a random Oracle methodology. And the thing I want to say here is it gives a very uh, clean and beautiful model to try for people to reason about cryptography applications. And it's 
it usually yields simple proofs and precise bonds. Okay, so um, okay, so having this very built for uh, easy to deal with uh, random oracle model, um, there's still some cracks in the in the model. So here I want to uh, 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 propose the following mismatch. So here's a mismatch between random oracle and one type of practical attacks. So this practical attacks uh, is a pra is basically attacks with pre-processing. So uh, this is what uh, on the left side of the picture. This is what we have. That is uh, the lower bound. In other words, like what's the maximum advantage an algorithm can achieve in the random oracle model. And what if in practice an algorithm can you know do pre-processing? Then what is the advantage the algorithm can achieve? So uh, CRHF, just to to remind you, this is the task to find a pair of collision. So for practical attacks in this category for CRHF, the probability is actually one. So why is that? Because as long as your pre-processing can contain you know a, a device and the advice is somewhat not too short, then you can always say um, the advice contains a pair of collision, right? So in other words, you can always hard code the answer into the pre-processing pre step, and then you can easily win this game. You can easily break the CRHF. It's probability one. You don't need to make any query. You simply by looking at your advice and you output the pair of collision. Okay, and you may say, okay, it's kind of like cheating because collision, this like collision finding problem. There's no a specific challenge, right? You're not. It's not like when we like uh, uh, pre, like when we function, you are sample a uniformly random image and let the algorithm trying to invert that image. Here, there's not such an object. But even for when we function, there's a gap between practical attacks with preprocessing and random oracle model. So uh, this in the random oracle model, the advantage is bounded by t over n. As we said, uh, it's basically um, tied with the attack of you know. Uh, querying a bunch of random inputs and hope you hit the uh, the target image. And what you can do practically is there's an attack called the rainbow table attack. So I use these two symbols, a rainbow and a table, to denote the algorithm, and I will uh, constantly use this symbol just to uh, make uh, things easier. OK, so it's a very beautiful attack, and um, I won't have time to talk about it, but the thing I want to emphasize here is Oh, okay, I didn't mention what is S. So here, this S is basically the size of the device, the pre-processing stage outputs. So you can think about um, in this practical attack, there's an algorithm first trying to do a very heavy pre-processing, and at the end of the day, the algorithm gets the uh, uh, output the data structure. The data structure roughly consists of S bits. Okay, so it's roughly S bits, and this S bits is exactly this uh, parameter S here. OK, so and as long as this data, uh, this advice is not too short, it will significantly speed up the, the chance of finding a pre image. So I think it's easy to see from the figure, right? Because you kind of like multiply the advantage T over N, which is an advantage in the random Oracle model by this S, which is the size of the advice you have. So uh, this is like the rainbow table attack saying, uh, and, and with the pre-processing, the practical attacks can significantly beat the security in the random Oracle model. Okay, it's a very interesting attack. And if you don't know that, I highly recommend you to uh, learn about it either by looking at some lecture notes or a Wikipedia page. But this is not something we will talk about today because it's an uh, upper bound. It's about the algorithm, but we are talking about attacks. Uh, sorry, lower bounds. In other words, what's the limitation of algorithms? All right, so that's the um, uh, cracks in the random Oracle model. So, uh, and you may ask why we care about this non-uniform attacks, why they are reasonable models. So first of all, uh, as I'm a cryptographer, for a cryptographer, stronger security is always better, especially if we're not paying too much. So if we can achieve something that's much stronger than the previous definition, why we, why we don't do that? So that's the first reason. And the second reason is this kind of attack, this rainbow table attack is actually very, very realistic. So this uh, function inversion problem 
is used in this password cracking. So you can think about you know when a server uh, tries to store password, they are not store password uh, in in its plain text. It's actually store their hash of the password. And you can think about this hash as basically the random oracle we 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 talk about. And when they compare the password, they simply compare their hash. So uh, this and if the if there's a you know a database uh, breach, then this pre-processing attack is really useful because. This uh, you can always use this rainbow table with a very heavy uh, pre-processing and then with a very uh, very small amount of uh, you know lookup uh, time you can basically invert each individual passcode and which is very very uh, very very dangerous for uh, database breach. And finally, uh, okay, that, that's basically some some reasons. So as we have seen the simplicity of random oracle model. As you know, it's if we don't talk about non-uniform, non-uniformity, non-uniform attacks, it really captures what happens in the real world. So, can we, you know, still save random oracle from this non-uniform attacks? So, the answer is yes, we can save that. And followed by a bunch of works, we show that at least in the classical world, we can do this. So, they solve this question by first propose a definition uh, in the classical world. Which uh, captures what non-uniform attacks looks like in the random oracle model. So um, let's first uh, record the random oracle model. So we model a hash function as a random function, which is drawn uniformly at random from the very very beginning. So which is this f. And the non-uniform algorithms are uh, modeled as uh, two-stage attackers, a1 and a2. And A1 is basically this uh, offline algorithm. So here we will see this A1 is the offline algorithm. It is unbounded. In other words, it has unbounded running time, and also the queries are unbounded. In other words, it can uh, learn every single bit about the function f. So in other words, it can, instead of writing A1 as an unbounded Oracle algorithm, it can also write it as A1, but take f as the input. They are basically the same. So this is the, the the A1, and at the end of the offline stage, also it takes can be it, it can takes any time, and the A1 produces a bounded and oracle dependent advice sigma. Okay, so the sigma is some function about s this f, and will pass the sigma to the online stage A2. So A1 is offline and A2 is online. Okay, so uh, so here this is the A uh, online algorithm. The online algorithm now is bounded because otherwise the problem becomes trivial. So, and it's trying to solve some problem. For example, trying to invert an image or trying to find a collision. But you know, collision finding is trivial in this setting. And it takes uh, this advice sigma and also have access to this f. And because of the sigma, this algorithm becomes non-uniform because it's now depend. It now depends on this uh, instance f. So here I want to emphasize two important parameters in this model. The first important parameter, as I said before, is the size of the advice sigma, which we will use this S, as I also mentioned before, which is uh, the, uh, in, the, in the rainbow table attack, it's basically the size of the data structure. And the second parameter is T, which is the uh, running time of this online algorithm A2. And any of this, uh, S or T, if there are there's no uh, a bound. In other words, and if we allow any S or T to be unbounded to be infinite, then the problem becomes trivial. The algorithm can always solve this without any uh, without any difficulty. Because if the advice is arbitrarily large, then the advice can simply be the original function f, and the algorithm A2 can by you know without querying f, but just looking at this uh, advice and learn. You know, trying to solve the problem, which is easy, or if the algorithm can arbitrarily query this function, that also becomes easy. Okay, so this is the definition about non-uniform algorithms in the random oracle model. So still, we have a random uh, function f, two, uh, and now we have uh, offline algorithm a1 unbounded, but the output is bounded, and a2, which is the online algorithm, the running time is bounded, but take this advice from a1. Okay, and they are trying to work together and solve problem. And with this definition, 
they show that these cracks can be fixed. They prove many security bonds for you know one way function, collision resistant hash, and all the many different applications, especially those carried by cryptographers against ST attackers. So here here ST attacks especially uh, means A1, A2 with this two parameter S and T. OK, so let's look at uh, some of the results. Um, yes, so uh, yes, so the first result is for a collision resistant hash. So before, uh, if we lo only look at their security in the random Oracle model, then this is not one, right? It's T squared over N, which is the birthday paradox. <clears throat> and in the non-uniform security uh, setting, it becomes one because you can always say sigma equals to the pair of collision and this becomes easy for the algorithm. So uh, this after we analyze this in the non-uniform model of uh, in the, the non-uniform random Oracle model, then the practical attacks matches with the theoretical uh, model. And uh, the more interesting case is a one way function. So in, in the one way function, the non-uniform security in the random Oracle model, they prove that to be ST over N. In other words, if uh, ST attacker, uh, sorry, if there's an attacker with S base of advice and a T online query, then it cannot invert a pre-image, invert an image with success probability more than ST over N. All right, so that's what they can prove, which also somehow matches with the practical attacks because the practical attacks shows that they can achieve uh, ST over N. It's actually, sorry, this is not plus, it's actually at the minimum of these two terms. Uh, I think I also have some typos and uh, some in the slides later, but yeah, I just want to say this is the minimum between ST over N and the second term, which is uh, more complicated. Okay. So there are, um, you know, get towards to the to the to the tight bond, and later on, uh, uh, people also prove that filling this gap by filling this gap because you realize that there is a gap between what we uh, know in the theoretical model, this non-uniform random oracle model, and the practical attacks. Failing the gap between this and this actually will resolve some interesting open questions for low, uh, circuit lower bound and communication complexity. So therefore, uh, removing this extra term is difficult, and we will ignore that in the talk. So whenever we see a lower bound is of this four, and an upper bound is of this form, we will say they're optimum because this is a, a kind of hard barrier. Okay, so that's everything we know about uh, collision resistant hash function and one-way function. So that's, I just give you two examples about the most uh, interesting case. All right, so, uh, okay, so that's about non-uniform random oracles and how they uh, solve this problem of, you know, match with this practical pre-processing attacks with this theoretical model. All right, so right now we are only talking about classical. So there's nothing quantum, and next we are going to switch to the quantum world. Okay. Yes, so this is what I uh, said. Filling this gap will um, resolve some uh, very important open question for circuit lower. Yep. Okay, so let's, let's switch to quantum world. So, uh, First of all, um, yeah. So what's different uh, when we switch to quantum? So first of all, is uh, the distinguishability of quantum algorithms. So I think you probably or are very familiar with that. That is, um, a quantum algorithm can use quantum physics to perform computation, and one of the most important ability is this so-called uh, superposition access. In other words, a quantum algorithm can compute a classical function in superposition. I think I don't need to explain that in this seminar, um, but that's the exact the, the you know, one of the most important part gives you uh, quantum advantages. For example, Grover's algorithm, which is the, uh, the quantum version of brute force attack, can search in an unstructured database with advantage T square over N. But classically, you can only achieve T over N, and this crucially relies on the relies on the uh, ability of making superposition query to the classical function. And similarly, back to our hash function case, as I said on the first slide, a hash function should be uh, known to everybody because 
it's a public function. In, in other words, all this uh, quantum uh, adversary, quantum algorithm, should be able to compute a hash function in superposition because the algorithm has the ability to compute any classical functionality, and also this hash function is publicly known. So therefore, this is the first uh, crucial difference between uh, quantum and classical in this hash function scenario. That is, the algorithm can make superposition access. All right. So uh, and therefore, it's very natural to propose the following uh, method. Uh, sorry, the following uh, uh, analog of this classical random oracle methodology, which we call quantum random oracle methodology, is also heavily used in cryptography to analyze security of many, you know, well-established uh, uh, protocols and its security in the quantum world. So still. Uh, there's a function, a random function we use to model a practical hash function. And this quantum random oracle methodology says that for most of natural applications, the security in practice is almost the same as the security in the random oracle model, a uh, quantum random oracle model, which means there's an algorithm B having uh, quantum access to this random function and trying to solve a task. Okay, so the difference here is that this function uh, the, now, we'll give the algorithm quantum access instead of classical access. So this is a quantum random oracle methodology, and whenever we're trying to analyze the security of hash function for a certain application, uh, which is uh, the case in the left side, we will usually think about a case uh, on the right side. That is, we are uh, thinking about an algorithm and making a quantum uh, query to this uh, random function. Okay, so. Uh, let's let's um, step back and think about the motivation between random oracle methodology. That's so the motivation is to help us better analyze the security of hash function and also provides tight bond. So in the random in the quantum random oracle model, do we still have this? So classically, we can have simpler proof and also precise bonds. So for precise bonds, the answer is yes. For one way function, we can show that in the ran quantum random oracle setting, the advantage is at most t squared over n, which matches with Grover algorithm. PRG is also tight, half plus t over root n. And for collision resistant hash, it's also tight. It matches with this BHT algorithm. It's, uh, uh, if we analyze it in the ran quantum random oracle model, we can show that the advantage of finding a pair of collisions is t cube over n which is exactly the same as what we can do with BHT algorithm. But the problem is, does, is that simple? Um, as an expert in this area, I would say it's not difficult, but you need some knowledge to, you know, it's, it's definitely more difficult than the classical analysis, because especially because now the algorithm has uh, quantum access to this random function, which makes all the proof, all the classical proof invalidated. So you need some ways to overcome that, but there's, uh, many tools which helps you to do this analysis and you know when you learn about all these tools the proofs uh, may not be simple but it's also not difficult right so that's the quantum random oracle methodology uh, it gives you a reasonably simple proof and also very precise bounds okay and uh, that's random quantum random oracle, and we can also define non-uniform quantum attacks in this ran quantum random oracle setting. So it's very similar to the classical attacks, which are defined by uh, two attackers, A1 and A2. So A1, same, is unbounded and produce a uh, bounded oracle dependent advice sigma. So here, uh, here's one subtlety. Uh, classically, we say this A1 is a classical act has classical uh, query to F, but here uh, we don't put a quantum query because A1 is unbounded. It can run, you know, infinitely many times. Or in other words, you can even give the function the whole description of the function to A1. So there, it basically makes no difference uh, between giving A1 quantum or classical access as long as the number of queries are unbounded. So here we don't distinguish between these two cases and produce. Uh, but here there's one subtlety in the quantum setting. That is, um, this advice can be either classical or quantum. And there's a very interesting uh, difference be, uh, to the classical setting because classically you 
I mean, you usually don't consider the advice to be quantum because one A2 and A1 are both classical. A2 usually don't have too much power to control this quantum state. I mean, maybe you can think about, okay, we can measure that in some basis, but I don't think that's a very natural model. But in the quantum model, it's, in the, it's very natural to think about this advice being either classical or quantum. And that gives you different uh, models, different non-uniform models. Okay, and so that's for A1. And A1 passes advice either quantum or classical to A2. And A2 is a quantum algorithm. Here I emphasize this by putting this F uh, into a bracket, meaning A2 can make quantum oracle queries to F and at most T queries. Okay, so that's the non-uniform quantum attacks. A1 being an unbounded algorithm outputting either classical or quantum advice and passing that to A2. And A2 making at most T quantum query together uh, with the access to the advice and trying to solve some problem. Okay, and one of the thing I want to emphasize here is the advice can be either classical or quantum. Okay. All right, so we are uh, getting close to what we're interested, the quantum uh, lower bound of this non-uniform attacks. So before we're looking at lower bounds, because lower bounds are usually more difficult, let's maybe first think about some algorithm. What can we do? And the first thing you may want to do is try to quantize this rainbow table and speed up Grover search. Right, because the rainbow table attack is exactly uh, what we can speed up the classical brute force attack. So a very natural way is to think about can we quantize this rainbow table and speed up the quantum version of the brute force attack. But the the best we are aware of for a long time is the following very very trivial algorithm. That is, um, uh, the the advice sigma is the classical rainbow table. In other words, we're not using it as quantum, even if it can be quantum. And our algorithm, our non-uniform algorithm, either run this rainbow table algorithm with sigma. So up to now, everything's classical. There's no quantum, even if we give that the algorithm, uh, the quantum capability. Or it's completely ignore the advice and run the Grover search algorithm. All right, okay, so the algorithm is super simple. Either it use the classical device, run a very a purely classical algorithm, or completely ignore advice and run a, you know, a quantum algorithm without any non-uniformity, without any advice. And the advantage is super simple, right? You're either you're achieving this. Actually, you're achieving uh, the maximum between the first term and the second term, but it's, uh, it's, it's of the same order. So I just want to make this look uh, simpler. Well, uh, the, you get the advantage, the first two terms from rainbow table, remember, and also I, I, I want to say there's the typo, it's actually minimum between the first and the second one, plus the advantage from Grover's algorithm, right? Which whenever, which one's bigger, you run the corresponding algorithm. So that's the very simple algorithm. Therefore, a very natural question is, this is a super naive algorithm simply combining the best we can do with advice and the best we can do with quantum. Therefore, we ask, does advice help quantum algorithm? And the most simplest case example is Grover search. Does advice help Grover search? Okay. So let's look at some uh, result, historical result. So this problem is actually first proposed by Nayebi, Arison, Bilov, and Traveson back in 2015, and they showed that the lower bounds is st squared over n with classical device. So here, the same uh, indicates the device being classical. Okay, so in other words, by looking at this term, it tells you it may speed up uh, Grover search, right? Having a device may speed up Grover search, because if there's no device, the advantage will be t squared over n, and this t the, the overall advantage is multiplied by the length of the device. So it does not rule out the possibility that a piece of, of advice significantly speed up Grover search. And following that uh, work, uh, Hans Sagawa and Yamakawa and Chang Liao Qian, they also show that uh, a very similar result, although they are proving that in different settings, for example, whether the algorithm are getting a function or a permutation, I mean, there, there are the different scenarios, but there are 
uh, they end up with a very similar bound ST over N, which does not rule out the possibility of you know, speeding Grover search algorithm with a device. Here, Chang, Chang Liao and Chen, they prove the result for both classical and quantum device. All right, so um, in my recent work, the, this work is uh, uh, was done three or two or three years ago by Chang, Guo, and Chen. We actually proved that when the device is a classical device, the best you can do is st plus t squared over n. Okay, so let me try to um, uh, talk about that more more closely. So the first term st over n is uh, connect to this rainbow table, right? As I said, this is uh, if we ignore the second term, there are we would say there are they match with each other, and the second term exists in light of the classical barrier. And the second uh, and then t square over n also matches with this t square over n. In other words, uh, I mean we, we can we can have a look at this classical uh, analog between these two and these two. So in other words, in our result, the previous result, we proved that indeed if a classical device is provided, then there is no difference. Oh, sorry, the classical device does not help Grover search algorithm. In other words. If the device is only classical, the best you can do is either use the classical device to do Grover search algorithm, oh, sorry, to do rainbow table algorithm, or you're completely ignoring the classical device and you run uh, a Grover search algorithm. So they are, they, 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 they never help with each other. Okay. And we also show that when the device is quantum, it seems to be a little bit advantage, although we don't know if this is tight. So we prove that it is at most ST plus T square over N, the same quantity as the classical one, the classical device one, but together to the uh, one over three. So remember, this is a probability. So if you uh, raise the power to one one third, it's actually amplify the probability, makes the advantage bigger. So, so uh, this actually gives some uh, leaves some gap between classical and quantum device. For example, we can we can we can think about the following. So usually we will think of we want to achieve 128 bit of security for t equals to s equals to 2 to the 64. Meaning if we have this much resources, t and s, we want the success probability to be smaller than uh, 2 to the minus 128. OK, so this is how we define this how, uh, bits of security. Then if with classical device, we need to set the security parameter, in other words, this big N, to be 2 to the 256. But if a quantum device is allowed, then by looking at this bound, what do we uh, need to do is to set this big N to be uh, 500, 2 to the 512. So it's actually leave a concrete security gap and also will affect the parameter choices. It's also actually a very interesting theoretical question because it still doesn't fully explain, uh, fully answer this question, the following question. That is, can quantum device speed up Grover search? Okay, so the, what we only know is Grover search cannot be speed up with a piece of classical device. Okay, so the question is, uh, okay, this is some other result, but I'm mostly focused on one way function today. Um, the question is, does quantum device really helps us? So this comes to our result. So our result says the following. Um, so let's still mostly focus on one-way function. So we show that um, even with quantum advice, we can uh, we basically achieve the, the same lower bound. So in other words, it's uh, st plus t squared over n, which is exactly the same as uh, what I uh, and other uh, co-author previously proved with classical advice. In other words, we show that there's no such a quantum rainbow table. In other words, even if you have access to a piece of quantum device, okay, about the function, the best you can do is basically let this advice to be classical. And you do rainbow table, the purely classical uh, pre-processing attacks, or you run Grover search algorithm. In other words, even quantum device does not really help you to speed up Grover search. So it's a really uh, surprising result. Okay, so, uh, and also we prove uh, basically matches the result for a quantum device with those with classical device. 
I, I won't expand on that. So if you if you look at this table, uh, for PRGs we match quantum the bound for quantum device also with that for classical device and also for sorting, which I didn't explain what sorting is. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but uh, basically, um, what we show is that for many natural security games or for many natural cryptographic applications based on hash functions, these two adversaries achieve the same power. So BQP poly and BQP Q poly, meaning this is like basically a non-uniform algorithm with classical device and a non-uniform algorithm with classical device. And in the same paper, which I don't have time to talk about today, we show that for certain contrived game, um, and when there's no online queries allowed, then quantum device is expand exponentially better. So in other words, this natural is really necessary because I find an example, well, quantum device is exponentially better than having classical device. And this is based on a recent work by Yamakawa and Zendry on this uh, public verifiable uh, quantumness based on random oracle. Okay, so uh, although we don't, uh, here, here I want to emphasize that we only prove the case for t equals to zero. So although we do not achieve a separation in the general case, we believe it's, uh, it's very helpful for understanding the difference between quantum device and may help to achieve a more general separation in the future. All right, so that's the main takeaway. One about uh, the power of uh, BQP poly and BQP Q poly in many uh, security games, in many crypto applications. And the other one is about the specific separation between these two adversaries. Okay. So, um, so finally, let me briefly go through the, um, the, the proof, the very high level idea. So I won't go into many of this detail, which or I'll just go through the historical uh, idea about how to prove the result and basically hide most of the uh, technical part. And if you're interested, feel free to look at the paper or we can discuss that online at some point. Okay. So uh, this is a very brief overview of the idea. So the most difficult part of this is the advice can be very complicated, right? So here I, I don't really constrain like how the advice is computed. This advice sigma can be, for example, the XOR of all the outcomes of the function F, or can be like any y, very weird function of this F. Okay, so, so maybe let's start with something easy. So what if this advice is well-structured? It's very, you know, very simple, very simple, well-formed advice. And here, by well structured, I mean, what if this advice is simply a list of input and output pairs? That's the most, uh, the easiest uh, advice you can imagine, almost, right? So, in this case, the security is very easy to analyze if the challenge avoids these coordinates. So, here I, I focus on, still focus on one way function. The goal is to uh, invert the image. Because, very on very high level, if the challenge image y, which you want to invert, hits any of this y1 to ys, then the problem is trivial. You simply, uh, by looking at this table, and you figure out what is the pre-image. And if it does not hit, then the rest of the co coordinates still remains random, and you cannot really use this advice. It's basically independent of the rest of the function, and you can, the, on the only thing you can do is brute force attack, right? So that's about uh, the intuition of well-structured advice. And this, this pre-sampling uh, on the title, I call it pre-sampling. The pre-sampling technique says that the advantage of any complicated device, so it's, it's really any advice, is at most the advantage of some longer but well-structured advice, right? So this is super helpful because any advice is very difficult to analyze but as long as you can, you know, transform that as advice into some very well structured thing, like what we have uh, in the middle of the slides, then it's very easy. Just it's like what I did here, right? So let's look at the statement more formally. So uh, in the statement, uh, they sh they define this uh, model called bit fixing model, bit fixing random oracle model. So here it's also parameterized by a P. 
So let, let me go that, uh, let me let me introduce it step by step. So it's basically a random oracle, but some of the coordinates, actually P of these coordinates are fixed. So let's look at that. So there's a, 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 a random, actually there's a choose table with uh, input one to N and the output being unknown, being, you know, still uh, try, will be sampled uniformly at random. Okay, so there's a adversary comes here and tries to fix at most P coordinates in the offline phase. Okay, so this is what, advantage, uh, what the ad adversary does uh, in the offline stage. So instead of that being a, a device, now it's basically being, uh, basically just trying to fix some coordinates of the function. Then the offline adversary leaves, and the rest of the coordinates are sampled uniformly at random. Okay, so it's mostly the same as a random oracle, except there are some coordinates that are fixed by an offline adversary. Then an online algorithm comes with a knowledge uh, of what coordinates are fixed and how they are fixed, and trying to, you know, break some cryptographic games. And in this situation, you can think about, you know, one way. Uh, function and if this only function the image hits any of the seven or 44 uh, 42 then the problem becomes easy otherwise it's the same as the regular one-way function without any device okay so this is the bit fixing model that will actually fix some at most p coordinates and then the player will play the game with this prefix random oracle okay and this Pre sampling uh, theorem says the following. So there are two statements, uh, there are two quantity. The first quantity is delta, which is the non uniform security in the random oracle. This is exactly what we are interested in, right? We're interested in the non uniform security in the random oracle model with S base of a device and T queries. And the second quantity is the uh, epsilon, which is a security in this, what I just mentioned, the bit fixing random oracle model having uh, p equals to s times t. And the pre-sampling theorem statement says the following. So this uh, non-uniform security of uh, s and t, delta of s and t is roughly the same as epsilon of p and t. Okay, so this p is basically uh, stands for a longer but well-structured device. Because if we go back to the slides, uh, uh, yes, we, we say that the online algorithm will have the knowledge about all these fixed coordinates, and you can think about these fixed coordinates as being uh, as being the uh, well structured advice. But it's longer, right? Uh, because uh, now instead of having less s, it's now it, it now has uh, less s times g. All right. Okay. So this is uh, why I said it's, uh, uh, the pre-sampling on very high level basically says uh, arbitrary device here S equals to a well-structured device of length roughly uh, uh, S times T, a longer well-structured device. Okay, so this is the pre-sampling um, pre uh, theorem. Okay, and now we can look at this. So when we function in the, as I just discussed, one way function game in the bit fixing model, random oracle model, gives you advantage t over n plus st over n. So the t over n comes from the case where the image does not, uh, you know, uh, hits in one of this uh, well structured device or this coordinates. Uh, and st over n is the probability that it hits any of these coordinates. So in other words, this epsilon pt equals to st over n, right? And sorry, could I, could oh. I jump in? Uh, yep, yep. So this pre-sampling uh, theorem, th this is all done in the classical domain, right? I just want to confirm In the that. classical crypto, here I did not uh, mention anything. Uh, yes, it's classical. Uh, there's it's no- Just function. classical bit processing before you put into the hash function, right? Am I? Yes. In, okay, good. Yeah, there's nothing quantum. I okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just want to make so the sure the quantum the quantum will appear in the next slide. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to recover how the bond was proved. Okay. Understood. So, Thank you. Yeah. So this is yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So this is bait fixing random oracle and combining with this uh, theorem. Hey, wait. Uh, okay. I think I lost the picture. But anyway, 
So we know that this epsilon PT equals to ST over N or P over N. And therefore delta is S of T equals to epsilon PT equals to ST over N, which is uh, the thing here. Okay, this recover, that recovers the classical lower bounds. Okay, so this is how we prove that in the classical world, the classical pre-sampling theorem. All right, so what's about, uh, how about um, trying to do that in the quantum world? So, uh, so let, let's, let's first look at this classical theorem again. So uh, now if we want to do it quantumly, first of all, we, are, we care about this random oracle being quantum random oracle, right? So this is the first modification we need to do. So now this, is ran this random oracle becomes Q wrong. And next, we would like to define another, you know, P bit fixing Q ROM here. And we try to prove an analog of this theorem statement. So this is what we want to do. So let's look at what this P bit fixing Q ROM looks like. So here's one attempt. The attempt is the following. So now we still arbitrarily classically fix on at most P co coordinates. So very similarly, we just, there's an algorithm, there's an adversary comes uh, trying to fix at most P coordinates in the offline phase. And the remaining coordinates are chosen randomly by the challenger, but the only difference is the online algorithm is quantum. Okay, this is a very natural way to leverage that, uh, to, to lift it to the quantum case. And this is our attempt. And with this definition, we also want to uh, prove the theorem statement, delta, which is the non-uniform security in the QROM, and epsilon being the security in the attempted Quant, uh, bit fixing quantum random oracle model, and I want to prove that delta is roughly epsilon. Okay, everything is the same as the classical one, except we have this being QROM, and we have an attempt definition for this PBF QROM. Okay, if we can prove that, very nice, very easy to analyze. Uh, you, you can imagine because uh, this is very much the same as what we can analyze in the classical setting, except in this part is quantum. Okay, however, having this like seems too nice and we actually will prove that if we want to uh, prove this theorem statement we don't know if that's true or false but we prove that if you want to uh, okay it's also it's not in this work it's in uh, one of the previous line of work show uh, appeared in uh, TCC two years ago and we show that if you want to prove this theorem statement with this definition it's actually almost impossible in the sense that it will implies Arisa and Benny's conjecture. All right. I'm not going too deep about it, but if you ever know about this conjecture, it's a major open question quantum computing, which asserts that exponential quantum speed up requires structure on inputs. It's a very important question and people spend lots of energy and effort, but still the progress are limited right now. So we therefore we believe this route, although we don't know if this is true or false, we believe this route may not be the uh, right way to go. And therefore we need to find a different way to quantize this bit fixing, all right? So therefore, um, facing with this barrier, we revisited the definition of bit fixing a random oracle in the classical setting. Okay, so we are trying to redefine what's the classical p bit, bit, uh, bit fixing random oracle. So this is classically what, how we define it, right? We classically fix p coordinates and the rest of them are random and the online algorithm is classical and actually we realize that this alternative definition is equivalent and it's easier to quantize and it works pretty you know easily with with the quantum lifting okay so this is the new definition the definition is the following so first we define a uh, algorithm b it, it can be any algorithm as long as it is a p query classical operator, p classical query algorithm. Okay, and then what we do is we doing such a rejection sampling. We sample a random oracle f, and we run this algorithm b with oracle access to f, and we see if the outcome is one or or accept. And we will run this until we see an accept. In other words, if the algorithm outputs reject, we will redo everything, including reset this quantum algorithm to its you know very uh, very original state and also sample this oracle again so there are two we need to reset both of the b and f and we will do this until we see a one and the online algorithm will play with this f okay so in other words instead of we fix some coordinates the rest of them being random now we are 
uh, define this distribution of the function by uh, having a rejection sampling procedure. Okay, so that, that's how we do it. Uh, okay, so this is how uh, we do it. And actually, um, it's easy to see that the definition below captures the definition above. But to prove they are equivalent, uh, you actually require a little bit more work, but still it's not too difficult. And I'm not going to uh, prove the equivalence here. Okay, so this is the, the new definition about bit fixing, random oracle. Okay, uh, and therefore, uh, let me, let me, okay, yes. So with that, we can very easily generalize it to the quantum setting. So now we can let B to be a P query quantum algorithm. Okay, so instead of that being a, quant, a P query classical algorithm, it now becomes a P query quantum algorithm. And now this rejection sampling is the same. A quantum algorithm quantumly query this F. So here, actually, I need to write it as a cat uh, F bra, but you, you, you know what I mean. And this algorithm will keep running uh, on this F until you see a one. And then the rest of the algorithm, uh, the online algorithm, will uh, play with this Oracle F. Okay, so this is how we define this quantum bit fixing. It, it's actually slightly more difficult than the original attempt definition because this fixing is somehow quantum, right? We're not classical fix the function anymore. We are somehow on very high level quantumly fix this F. And with that, still we can show that um, uh, when we function, the PRG has the corresponding security in the bit fixing QROM. So here, Let's let's look at one-way function. So the the security of one-way function is p plus t square over n. The t square over n comes from Grover search, and p over n somewhat on very high level comes from you hit this quantum fixing of of this uh, by this b. All right. Okay. So uh, although it won't be as easy as a proof uh, as a classical proof because this uh, quantum fix. Okay. So this is how we define it. And very luckily, with this definition, we can show that this pre-sampling works, at least for classical device. We show that uh, when we have this delta and epsilon and this epsilon with p equals to st, this other security, other parameter works with the classical, uh, with the classical pre-sampling theorem. Then we have delta roughly equals to epsilon. When this game is a search game, in other words, we, we care about, and this probability is more, then they are roughly the same. Or if it's a decision game, we can also prove that they are very close to each other. Okay, and by plugging uh, the security of one-way function, then uh, which is p plus t squared over n with p equals to st and uh, delta roughly equals to epsilon, we can show that one-way function has security epsilon of st equals to st plus t squared over n, which exactly. Uh, recovers what uh, the lower bound is and matches with the class well, with the with the upper bound. That is the uh, rainbow table classical algorithm combining with quantum Grover search. Okay, so because this story is very long and you realize, okay, I haven't talked about you know uh, what really this work does, but that's almost uh, we are almost there. So this work on the very high level does the following. So um, okay, sorry. Uh, before I talk about that, um, for I just talk about classical device, but for quantum device, there's still also a connection between delta and epsilon, but they are more complicated and non-tight. For example, for one-way function, there will be an extra exponent, and for PRG, it's even more complicated. So what this work does is proving a pre-sampling theorem even for quantum device. Okay, so this is our theorem statement. Everything remains the same, except now this classical device become quantum device. And by setting this P equals to ST, we prove that delta is roughly equal to two epsilon. And similarly, um, if the game is a search game, which this two extra, this is the, the extra two factor is, uh, is, is a bad thing for decision game, we have a, a, a bound for decision game, which just also remains the same as the classical a device case and also the the purely classical case okay and therefore by combining with this together we can recover the bound okay and therefore we prove that this one-way function has security roughly st plus t square over n even with quantum device okay. so they are almost the same as 
not almost, but uh, exactly the same as having classical device and quantum online computation. So uh, let's look at uh, this result again. Um, so I spent a lot of time talking about you know the history about how this presampling uh, looks like and the barriers and also uh, what the question this work uh, solved. So uh, in in the work by CGLQ, we show that with classical device it is ST plus T square over N, and there's a gap between uh, with quantum device. And in this work, we tighten this with uh, with even for quantum device. And also there's a, a S square T over N square gap here, but that's uh, we, we ignore this term in light of the classical barrier. And also for PRG, we also tighten the bond uh, between classical device and a quantum device. Okay. So uh, I think uh, now let's uh, do a conclusion. So what I what do we have learned from that? So first, we we learned from that is direct lifting sometimes does not work. For, um, I mean, it's actually in a lot of cases it does not work. But here we learned that there's a barrier for this direct lifting of free sampling. Right? We have a classical version of the uh, classical pre-sampling, and we want to have a quantum analog of the pre-sampling. And the first idea is trying to uh, quantize that in the in the most direct way. And we we spend a lot of time, and we realize that it's actually very difficult. If we can prove that, we prove a conjecture, and therefore finding an equivalent definition, a more quantum friendly definition is usually always better and help you to really solve this question. So that's the, uh, the first thing we learned from this. And second, uh, security in the uh, this quantum bit fixing random oracle model actually implies non-uniform security with quantum device. Right? And therefore, if you are interested in non-uniform security with quantum device in the quantum random oracle model, you can always looking at the security in this bit fixing quantum random oracle model, try to analyze this simpler model and it will give you uh, the security in the non-uniform model. I have a general reduction in the paper. Okay. And finally, for many natural games, quantum device is as good or as bad as classical device. So um, that's three messages I want to uh, convey in the talk. I guess that's uh, Perhaps everything. I do have some technical stuff, but I think the time is almost uh, finished, right? Yes, so that's everything I want to talk about today. And if you want to learn a little bit more about the technical stuff, I do have the technical slides ready. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It's a very uh, impressive work, line of work. So you Yes, thank you. Yeah, quite, quite heavy in a sense. <laughs> yeah, so I spend the uh, time to talk about the the um, the motivation behind that, and also the 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 very high level idea about this pre-sampling. Yeah. And in, in this work, uh, a very interesting thing is, I, I l l let me, I mean, because I finished the talk, so I think it's mm -hmm. maybe interesting to to mention a little bit of the technique mm -hmm. techniques behind that. So uh, we, we can we can go. In this slides, so and uh, uh, th this slides. So in, in the work, in the previous work, there's like a very big reduction trying to connect this non-uniform security, uh, sorry, non-uniform security to this bit fixing random oracle model. And mm -hmm. one of the novelty in this work, which I didn't have time to mention, is we use uh, this Mario Watchers framework to analyze multi instance game. Okay, so. Let, let, let me, you don't need to read the slide, so let me talk about it because there are so many things on the slide. If we have time, mm -hmm. we can talk about it. So the, 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 the difficult part here is in the proof, we need to uh, start with a non-uniform algorithm and then we want to use the algorithm to solve multiple instance mm -hmm. of the same problem. So you can think about it. you have a non-uniform algorithm and trying to uh, do this function inversion, let's say two times, or actually in the proof, there will be multiple times. So one time is easy because the algorithm, you just simply run the algorithm. But what if two times? Because you have a, it's a quantum non-uniform algorithm. The advice can be quantum. If you run the algorithm once, you know, you measure the result, the, the advice will be, well, maybe collapse. 
and it's impossible for you to run the algorithm the second time. So that's really the, where the difficulty comes from. This really, you know, what's different between classical advice and a quantum advice? Because in the reduction, you want to use this algorithm multiple times, but because it's quantum advice, when you use it one time, it will completely collapse and it, you can only use it one time. So this paper gives you a framework showing that, okay, you can generalize in certain way, you generalize this multi-instance game into a very, you know, very interesting uh, different form of game and all the reduction in the classical setting can work in the quantum set. So that's like roughly how, like the technical part of the paper. Is. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's, it's quite, quite interesting. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you very much for the presentation as well. Uh, I'm going to open for uh, other questions, if the audience has any. Okay. So if anybody wants to ask something. Uh, I think we don't have uh, maybe any questions. I, maybe I jump in. Could I, could, I, uh, could, could you go back to this, uh, this result slide that you compare your, your result and the classical result? I think uh, it's two slides toward the end, uh, this one. Yeah. Yeah, so from what I can tell, uh, basically you, your work has almost as good as the classical lower bound for the non-uniform security, right? Uh, classical device, yeah. Here, yeah, with, here, class yeah, yeah, with classical device, class but the thing is, even even you have cla purely classical case, it's ST uh -huh. over N. There's no T squared okay. because that comes from Grover search, right? So oh, okay. if that's purely classical, it's ST over N. If that's okay. classical device with quantum, you have a, you have an extra term, which is from mm -hmm. Grover search. Okay. And what's amazing is even if you have quantum advice, the result shows, okay, there's no way you can use a quantum advice. You can only use it in a classical way, okay. in, the, in the rainbow table. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yep. I see. Yep. In yeah. other words, like there's no way you can, you can, you know, uh, prepare a very, you know, complicated device and help you to, you know, speed up online Grover search algorithm. Because okay. you can, some, sometimes you may wonder, okay, the Grover, search algorithm, you keep doing this Grover diffuser, and maybe uh -huh. you can kind of like stop at certain point and use this state to trying to solve different instances. But this result okay. tells you it's impossible because okay. when you do this Grover diffusion, you're kind of like rotate the state into certain direction. You have, you know, uh -huh. a specific target in your mind, right? When you do this okay. diffusion, you are trying to find a pre image of certain image. Okay. Uh, and, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe let me uh, ask yeah. uh, this question another way. So, yeah. are there instances in the security setting that a quantum a device would help? Uh -huh. I think in this case, it doesn't help. It doesn't really. It's a help, very right? very yeah. interesting question. So, uh -huh. uh, the first result uh, I show is let me go back. Uh, let me. I think that's what be easier. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, yes, yes, this slide. So first of all, you know, one-way function PRG or sorted collision resistant hash, I mm -hmm. show that there are or there's no advantage. Mm -hmm. And also I show that there's like a, this generic thing called salting. I'm not sure if mm -hmm. uh, people are familiar with that, but it's kind of like you, you put an extra data into mm -hmm. your cryptographic application and you can mm -hmm. uh, just like, you know, for collision finding, you're not finding a collision X, X prime with their image mm -hmm. equals, to, equals to each other, you are mm -hmm. trying to find x x prime such that h of some salt, which which we call salt, h of mm -hmm. s and x equals to h of s and x prime. In other words, you require the prefix of the of the of the input to be the mm -hmm. same. This is mm -hmm. what we really call salt salting, and it's mm -hmm. a very generic mechanism. And this generic mechanism can be used here and defeat preprocessing. In other words, if you use this mechanism and you plug it into any cryptographic application in the random Oracle model, in mm -hmm. the, then it automatically becomes secure, even with quantum device. And the bond is the same for both classic and quantum. So mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the good news. And the bad news is the follows. Um, so, so the good news meaning there's a way you can prevent arbitrary quantum device. It's a very generic compiler. 
Mm -hmm. Having a crypto crypto application, you just use this salting mechanism, which I just described. It kind of like require the uh, the, the prefix of the data to to be consistent with uh, with what I what I propose. Then it will remain secure against quantum, even quantum non-uniform attacks with quantum advice. Mm -hmm. So and but the thing here I mentioned is that there's something unnatural, mm -hmm. and showing quantum advice is exponentially better. And that mm -hmm. comes from the recent work by Yamakawa and Zandra. Ah, okay, okay. I show that um, there's a specific application uh, based on random oracle, based on the hash function. Mm -hmm. And if you have quantum device, then you can invert uh, some one-way function. If you only have classical device, even if the classical device is sub-exponentially large, there's no way for you to find a pre-image. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a uh, 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 result about you know some crypto application that give you separation, but that's definitely not something you will use in practice. And okay. I believe um, I believe most of the applications they are I don't see you know differences between them. So I think the more the most interesting thing is to understand the power of you know BQP poly and BQP poly uh, Q poly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, with some, you know, specific, very contrived games. This is where I see some hope. And I, I have a follow up work showing uh, the separation under under some some scenarios, but it's not like a general separation. OK, yeah. very interesting. So so recently we uh, also inside our group, we, we started a very small uh -huh. um, uh, study group on, on cryptography. So we, we are going to uh, we we have a, a a few person working in this direction now, so uh -huh, definitely yeah. we will get back to, uh, get back in touch and 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 yep. ask for opinions and, and things. That yeah, sounds Good. very interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you very much. So. Yeah. All right. I'll stop the recording now.